We'll get started in just one minute. We were giving people a, a few minutes to come in and get settled. Just one minute. All right, well, let's get started. I want to thank everybody for coming in um, to a, a meeting so early. Um, it's obvious that this subject is important to, to quite a number of people here. Um, we'll get started without um, too much um, deliberation. What we wanted to do here was to get um, comments from people who have both been significant contributors to the IGF in the past and those that um, have been significant participants um, with respect to um, some comments about what they find um, useful and, as the title says, why the IGF matters. Um, and then towards the second part of the meeting, um, we'll talk a little bit about sort of the funding um, and the structure and the current situation so that people have that as, um, as background as well. Um, what I'd like to do um, is we have um, Zhuang Zhu, who's the... Um, He's in the United Nations Department of Economic, um, well, he's actually Division for Public Administration and, and Development Management, DPADM. They changed the title. And actually, that's the old title. L I'm looking on the website, but it's still the old title. It's now the department, DPIDG. Yes. Um, it's, it's the Division for Public Institutions and Digital Governments of UNDESA. Thank you, Wyman. I'm actually on the website looking, but I obviously pulled up an old, old link. Um, as you all know, uh, DESA is actually the administrative home of the IGF, so they provide support um, and the um, institutional home within the United Nations, and they are the administrators of the IGF Trust Fund. Um, so Zhuang um, would like to say a few words. Um, he apologizes in advance because he needs to leave in just a little while for another meeting. But then we'll come back and we'll work through the, um, the agenda with the speakers up there as, as outlined. Zhuang, thank you. And apologies for not enough coffee, I guess, because I know yeah. you're division. <laughs> thank you. I, I just got a, a call that I have to leave in half, less than half an hour to join my USG in, in the bilateral. So I want to apologize in advance. Um, but I do want to just say a few words to, first of all, John Ling in thanking everyone. And secondly, um, to recognize all the champions uh, who have been uh, advancing the IGF course. I mean, without you as champions, we will probably not have come this far. And the third comment I want to make is that uh, I often to my co talk to my colleagues that the IGF, you know, the past 14 years have really accumulated such a treasure of uh, ideas, knowledge, and expertise. And because of the limitations we face at the secretary staff level, we haven't been able to extract all this and to really achieve the value added for the IGF community. And so this is uh, one thing I hope that uh, we can change uh, in the year to come uh, so that uh, uh, one of the shortcomings that um, the IGF community has raised about how the IGF discussions can turn into ideas to help guide policies. And so that's a missing link we hope to achieve. And uh, the other thing I hope we can do with additional uh, funds is to do this capacity building thing. I remember there was a, a youth participant a few years ago saying that, you know, at IGF, we have the pioneers, the, the fathers of the uh, internet with us, and we have uh, all these brilliant minds with us. You know, what a pity that uh, the young participants did not have a chance, and some of the policy making from developing countries do not have a chance to meet with them and to pick their brains, so to speak. Um, but all of this, to make it happen, uh, we need continued funding support. So. These are the two main ideas that I have uh, and two immediate priorities I think my colleagues have um, to um, make them happen in the coming year or two, which will go a long way to uh, address the deficiency that has been identified so far. 
Uh, so I want to uh, urge all the participants here, the champions here, to go around, champion the IGF course, and to work with us in continuing resource mobilization so that the real potential uh, of the IGF can be achieved. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Thank, thank you, Zhuang. The, um, so maybe just one, where everybody has a, a little postcard, a large postcard, actually, in, in front of you. Um, and the last paragraph actually says, and, and just in case there are people here that aren't particularly familiar with this, that of course the IGF is an extra budgetary project of the United Nations. That means that member states' contributions do not fund the IGF. The annual meetings are largely funded by the host country government. So the trust fund, which is again administered through um, Endesa, actually supports the secretariat, which supports the MAG meetings, it supports travel for MAG meetings from developing countries, and it supports some travel, um, again, for individuals from developing countries to come to the IGF meeting. Um, and so that's what we are primarily, um, if you will, looking for support for. Um, there may be some more information shared later, but um, roughly the annual budget that's in the project document is 2.8 million a year budgeted. And right now we're taking in roughly about 40% of that a year. Roughly about 40%. Um, that directly impacts the level of staff we can put in the secretariat. Um, I don't know how they do all they do, um, and I think they do that without sleeping and eating a lot, and not just during the week of the IGF, but, but year-round. So it really is critically important that we find a way to increase the resources to the trust fund to support the secretariat, because it's so critical to the work we're doing here. Um, a lot of people want more outputs and more reporting um, and um, a little more structure around some of the supporting activities, and that only comes with um, additional resources in in the secretariat. So I just wanted to do that quickly for background. We have um, more time at the end of the day with um, some representatives that are responsible for the, the finances for IGF, and we'll close out the last sort of 20 minutes or so of the meeting with that. Um, but right now, what I'd really like to do is to ask the next four or five people to take about three minutes each um, and talk to us about why the IGF matters. So first we have Christine Arita, who, of course, Egypt has hosted an IGF in the past, Sharm El Sheikh, which was a great venue, and I think every one of the IGFs has been a pretty significant turning point, but that one, that one was as well. Christine is actually director of the International Technical Coordination Department at the National Telecommunication Regulatory Authority of Egypt. So, Christine, you have the floor. Um, thank you very much, Lynn, and thank you for inviting me to be um, uh, here at this meeting. And, um, yeah, Egypt... Um, Egypt has been a firm believer of the IGF since the very start, um, partially because of pioneering champions. Uh, yesterday we have remembered uh, the late Dr. Tarek Kemal, who was instrumental actually um, uh, for the inception of uh, the IGF, I would say, uh, since the WISIS. But Egypt as a country um, is a believer of the IGF specifically because it supports the multi-stakeholder approach um, uh, to internet uh, uh, policy making and internet governance. And, um, uh, just a brief overview uh, where we've been, I mean, through the, the, the working group on internet governance uh, and then moving through WISIS, and then even for the preparatory phase that was prior to Athens, um, uh, we have tried to, uh, to mobilize the region, not only uh, us as a country, but also the African and the Arab region. Um, on our way to Athens, we were there since Athens, and then we hosted, as you uh, mentioned, uh, the meeting, the fourth IGF meeting in, uh, in Sharm el-Sheikh. Um, what, what's, what was interesting for us to see is actually the development course that the IGF went through in those 14 years, um, going through uh, both uh, a renewal of mandates, uh, but also the enhancements that were um, proposed by the community. I, I think I, I, having been there in, uh, in 2009, which is exactly 10 years ago, and then watching the MAG um, and the different pro intersessional processes of the IGF, and the IGF itself every year evolve, I have to say that um, um, we have gone a long way. Um, I think what, what we have done is, I mean, what the community of the IGF has done is to provide a space uh, where discussions can flow um, in a very open and inclusive manner. 
I would say we have gained a lot of trust uh, from the different uh, stakeholder groups. The IGF has gained this trust, and so people come to inherently discuss at the IGF what they would go and uh, in other venues um, go into maybe deep policy making if I talk from the perspective of governments. It is always uh, very good for governments to come here and discuss in a space what's going to be actually um, uh, done in a more tense uh, environment elsewhere. Um, but what, what we have right now, I would say, is a new phase. So uh, with all what is happening, um, proposals for uh, more involvement, uh, more, um, um, let's say, uh, that the IGF actually moves a step further, I would say uh, it needs more fun to do that. And, uh, and this is something that um, I know governments should genuinely believe in, uh, but that's the different story. I think here we're talking about the trust fund and to, to be able to uh, enable all the different functions that you'd like to IGF to do, we really need to have some more funds come uh, to the Secretariat, but also to have the Secretariat and the different processes of the IGF evolve to what's being discussed and what's being proposed. I would like to take also the perspective of the NRIs without going too long, because this is another um, area where we as Egypt believe uh, is a, um, a success of the IGF, if I put it this way. The IGF has inspired so many processes on national and on regional level. And people uh, tend to put those in one basket, NRIs, which is true, but they're different. On national levels, um, you have a completely different discussion than the one you're having on a regional level. And, and it's important to have both, actually, I would say. And in order to do that, um, one of the shortcomings that I have personally um, uh, have, uh, or we as Egypt have um, uh, touched is um, when, when you host something, we host in Egypt the Secretariat of the Arab IGF, for example. We've also hosted a couple of meetings of the African IGF and the North African IGF. But when you want the Secretariat to come to your meetings, to talk to, to policymakers in, in your country, in your region, you need funds. And I understand when you have limited staff, they can't go to 114 national and regional IGFs. They can't support them, even if they don't travel. They can't really support them a lot. They're doing a marvelous job. We have Anya doing a great job for the NRIs. But it's within the limits of their capacities. So if we really want to have, um, I don't know, uh, all the, uh, the, the slogans, uh, help desk, um, um, I don't know, different cooperation that goes down to the grassroots, we need to put more resources into that in order to be able to make the linkage that we're aspiring and uh, connect those bridges that we're talking about. And um, I, I, maybe I'll stop here and I can intervene later. Thank you. I mean, those are very good points, Christina. Um, and one of the things we'd like to do as we continue through the fundraising activity as well is share some of the experiences of our experiences here with the NRIs. Uh, even this postcard was actually done on an open source. Um, Sylvia Kadena actually introduces to us an open source that people can use and do it themselves, obviously for hard copies or prints. And I think we can do more to help local fundraising efforts as well as, of course, continuing to increase the visibility globally. And if I could take just a moment, because I just looked to my left and I saw Henriette there. I didn't see you come in. Henriette Esterhausen is the incoming um, MAG chair. So she will take over at the end of this week. And I just wanted everybody to make sure they were aware that she was here and applaud her coming in. <laughs> Thanks, Lou. Thanks very much. I, and needless to say, um, I feel more able <laughs> um, seeing all of you in the room being concerned about these issues. Thanks. And looking forward to collaboration and support from all of you. So next, um, at least next on the one here on my phone, was Vint Cerf. Mm -hmm. Vint, of course, is the Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist for Google, um, also one of the fathers of the Internet. And Google, of course, has been a, a very significant supporter of the IGF, um, both in terms of participation. Um, Vint is one of the very few senior people that come and stay for the entire <laughs> IGF and is in the sessions and meeting and engaging with people. And of course, they're also a significant financial um, contributor as well. So Vint, you have the floor. So thank you very much and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm, I'll be brief. Uh, this is a fairly simple equation. Uh, first of all, uh, think about the, um, the various parties that benefit from the existence of the internet. Uh, my company is one of them. You know, if the internet weren't here and if the web weren't here, we wouldn't be here either because our entire business is very dependent on that infrastructure. Uh, the second point to be made is that uh, we've all agreed, since we're sitting here at IGF, that multi-stakeholder processes are uh, the right way forward 
for uh, our examination of internet governance. And I think we might also all agree that governance uh, is needed in order to make of this infrastructure uh, an environment in which uh, people can uh, feel safe and secure, that companies uh, can uh, organize, create, and operate new uh, applications. And so governance is, however it is uh, done, and uh, however it is applied, is important to achieve the kind of stability that's needed for all of the stakeholders that uh, benefit from the internet. So the third uh, point to be made about that is that this funding for the IGF effort should be multi-stakeholder. Uh, that suggests that there should be funding coming uh, from all of the various participants, and we all recognize that not all participants are in a comparable position to contribute. And so we shouldn't misunderstand this as an expectation that a small startup or something should uh, be in a position to contribute the same amount that a well-established uh, internet operation uh, might, uh, might do. So uh, my sense right now as a member of the, uh, the business community uh, is that we need to step up uh, in a multi-stakeholder way to assist in the uh, funding of the Secretariat. Uh, so I can't make any uh, immediate um, financial promises other than to say I will take back to, uh, to Google and to uh, other companies like ours uh, the argument that uh, IGF and, and its Secretariat deserve support on a regular basis from our community. Uh, and so that's my commitment, is to take that message forward and uh, hope that uh, at the next IGF I can report that, uh, that uh, more than 40% of your budget uh, is being covered by contributions. Thank you. Thank you, Vin. And again, I know a lot of us would like to give our personal thanks to you personally for all your support and effort and the fact that you're always here and so available. Um, obviously, it's a, it's a, a big big undertaking. Life would be boring otherwise. <laughs> Some days one might wish it so. <laughs> uh, chat. We have Chat, um, who's the Executive Director for the Association for Progressive Communication. Um, chat Romillo. Chat, you have the floor. Good morning. Um, it's early, so let me start with a story. Uh, about um, about one of the um, one of the women we have brought here. So her name's Immaculate, and she's from a village in Uganda, in Gulu. So how did she come here? She traveled 12 hours on a bus from her village to Kampala, uh, went to the embassy because she didn't know if she had a visa. Luckily, she did get a visa traveled all the way from Uganda to here. It's the first time out of her country. So I, I guess I wanted to tell this story to say why IGF matters, because I think um, there are people um, who uh, come and experience the IGF, and we experience it in different ways. And for us, we've brought a number of um, women uh, and men from community centers networks in vi villages. And I think it's an important um, element or feature um, of these processes where we can bring a diversity of participants. From APC, this is what we do every year, and we've been in this process from before IGF up to now. So we still find that it's relevant because we make it relevant for um, our constituency we make sure that their voices are heard. We make sure that they participate in the process. Because I think participation is not just us speaking for, for people who are not able to come. We need to bring them here. And I think diversity is an important element of why IGF matters, and we need to keep that. And this process will not be possible if it's not organized in this way. So I think that's a, an important element. I think the next um, thing I wanted to say around how, why it matters is as you said, Christine is around the national and regional. We also do that. We participate from a national and regional. And we make sure, we make sure that we, the connections are made. So we don't only come once a year. It is part of the, our whole um, participation. It's, we see it as a continuing process. So we make the most of it in this way. 
And the third thing I'd like to point out is that participation needs capacity. Capacity to actually be able to make use of the process. And one of the things that APC has done to make sure that we make, you know, we, we make the most of it is, our, is um, being involved in organizing the, the African School of Internet Governance. And I know that there's many of it. I guess I make this point to just say that the, the resources that, that contribute to IGF is quite vast. We, don't, we probably don't see it. Um, but as a whole, it's quite a lot as a collective. But it's, as, as, uh, it would not be possible to bring this together if we did not have a global process and a global organization mechanism that does it. So I, I, I think that to me is the why it matters. And it's also important for all the stakeholders to make it matter for ourselves and for our work. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Chat. And of course, it's not just the financial support that's essential, it's also the participation in all the activities. And APC has been just outstanding at participating and contributing and sending in comments, whether it's um, to kind of surveys and consultations or it's supporting a lot of the BPF work, gender and access. And, and it, I mean, it, it really is essential, essential that we have that level of participation and I think that continuity as well. So just really want to recognize that and, and thank you. Uh, next, we have Martin Botterman, who is recently appointed chairman of the board of directors of ICANN. Um, ICANN has been a very strong um, and significant supporter of the IGF since day one, both um, in terms of um, uh, financial contributions, cash, but also a lot of the in-kind services, um, such as trans uh, the transcription um, and that sort of thing as well. So. There are many ways you can contribute and support the work of the I, uh, IGF. You can actually get in and participate physically. You can um, volunteer uh, in-kind services and, of course, um, financial contributions to support the trust fund. Martin, you have the floor. So thank you, Lynn. Thank you for the opportunity to, to also speak on this. What we saw yesterday at the opening session and the contributions from state leaders, Guterres, Merkel, it's an amazing reflection of how far internet governance has come. Uh, state leaders who actually speak, not from their speaking notes alone, but also from their heart and really understanding the issues. Uh, I think that's one of the reflections that shows why this has become so important in our lives as well, if it uh, hits that, that presence as well. Uh, so I can, like many stakeholders, in IGF, we are focused on our own role. And uh, we are aware that our role, which is specifically to provide this identifier system in a stable and secure way, uh, can only be carried out in a larger context. It means nothing in isolation. And the IGF offers the opportunity to really uh, allow that to happen. As not many other stakeholders, but there are a few. We also understand how difficult it is to have this global reach in reaching out to multi-stakeholders because we need to do the same thing, focused on our mission, but also for us it's very important that we do reach out to the regions and to stakeholders across the board, which are part of the multi-stakeholder system that's actually managing the bottom-up process that ICANN manages the, the, the route. So, in that, uh, I can have indeed strongly supported the IGF uh, as a positive example of an effective platform of stimulating constructive dialogue ac across the Internet's global uh, multi-stakeholder community. Over the last years, within IGF, we've seen an explosion of regional and national IGFs, which I think are as important as uh, the, the, this central being where things come together. Uh, this is also how you bring it to the people and people who are there can again also gathering here. Not all of them, but some of them, which is a good way to expand the message to include the, the, the opinion of many. So uh, therefore we are also active on all levels. We offer things to support to regional and, and national IGFs, or we just bring in uh, knowledge. We share 
uh, 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 expertise were very useful. And uh, in that, uh, I think that's, that's a, a crucial thing to do. So for us, the IGF is really something that uh, helps us to enable to create an environment in which we can fulfill our mission and contribute with that unique identifier system. So we report back also along the WISIS uh, action lines. A clear example is there uh, to support language and cultural diversity with uh, uh, support the introduction of international internationalized domain names um, and with other scripts. So also to allow the next billion users who may not be able to use the ASCII script, the English language, to benefit from it, even if more local than global from this same system. So uh, with that, I'm really uh, very happy again to be here with uh, a good part of my colleagues uh, being involved in the meetings and, and participate to the discussions and to meet many uh, people who've been here before, but also always new people. So that's very good to see. Yeah, thank you, Martin. Um, not only is Martin engaged in the IGF through his ICANN, um, he's also leader of one of our dynamic coalitions as well, the Internet of Things. So he personally is participating in, and has supported the work for some time. Um, this might be, before we go to our final speaker, just a, a time to actually thank all of the Internet technical community for their support. Um, ICANN's a significant supporter. The regional Internet registries are a significant supporter. And, of course, the Internet Society is a significant supporter. Between them and the private sector, of which Google is probably the longest standing and most significant supporter, they roughly cover about 90% of our total funding. So, um, sorry, between governments, between governments and um, the technical community. So the private sector is significantly far behind in terms of contributing here. And depending on what year and what horizon you're looking at, I think roughly it's about 40, 45 percent of the funding comes from either governments or the technical community, and in total it's about 90 percent. And that excludes things like the one-off contribution from the German government this year for some of the developing country activities, because that really is a one-off. But when we look at consistent donations, so we need to find a way to reach out to um, the private sector. Also, some statistics I looked at for a chapter I wrote in a book recently um, actually said that in 14 years of the IGF, less than 25 countries have contributed financially, most of them only once or twice, and that usually happens around the time of hosting um, an IGF meeting, and less than 30 organizations or businesses. So when you think about the world, <laughs> I mean, it's an astonishingly small number. And one of the things I think we need to do is to make some of this a little bit more visible on the IGF website. Two years ago, we did a massive exercise to do frequently asked questions and the statistics and put a lot of information up that is more in keeping with what the Internet community does, but did push some of the boundaries within the, the UN in terms of um, some of the things they would normally um, make available. So always appreciative of DESA for leaning into um, you know, what the community expects and pushing some of those um, internal boundaries as well. But if people don't know that we're at 40 percent of what was budgeted and that it's this level of support we're getting from governments and we're not making the case ourselves for, so we need to, we need to, I think, all step up and do that more ourselves and I think we need to make it a little bit more visible on the, on the IGF website as well. We took some very, very significant steps last year in particular I want to thank Armin and Wyman who were very instructive in that. Um, so, for our last speaker, we have Hartmut Glaser. Brazil, of course, has hosted uh, two IGF meetings, um, and that's been done um, very significantly through the support of CGI.br. So, Hartmut, thank you, and you have the floor. My name is Hartmut Glaser. I am a German. I am a Berliner living in Brazil. Uh, not in the forest, but in the small city of Sao Paulo. Uh, all my life I spent in the university teaching, and my university was one of the first who tried to connect Brazil to the United States. We have a very good relationship. But 
1995, we start with the multi-stakeholder model in Brazil. Before WISIS, before ICANN, before IGF, it's part of our DNA in Brazil that we use the multi-stakeholder model, not only in theory, not only on paper, but practicing day by day the consensus approach for our solutions. The steering committee, I am the executive secretary, so I work for them. I have 21 bosses, uh, 21 members, uh, multi-stakeholder members, bottom-up process, election process. The government has only nine seats from 21, so 12 are elected, the majority. And for us, it was very, very easy to say we support IGF because we have our small structure in the country. Uh, and we like to support this platform. My understanding is the best way to train to come in is to have a platform that you sit together. Uh, because of my university, my state university that I was related, I need very, very often go to the capital in Brasilia and discuss with ministries, try to bring money back to, for research and development. And uh, the, the platform that IGF offers to the world, I think is the best way that we can come together. My understanding is different generations, young people, uh, medium age, older as myself, uh, and different backgrounds, different cultures, different uh, traditions. We need to learn to listen to others, to learn from others, and then try to improve. And this for me was the secret of IGF. My understanding is that if we don't have time to listen, to discuss, uh, to implement, to improve, we will be in a silo, we'll be alone in some corner and never will uh, be together. It was very easy for us to invite the second IGF in Rio de Janeiro, 2007. I was the local organizer, so I know how hard it is to organize an event. And after we have one or two ICANN meetings in Brazil, I said, never more I will be part of the local committee. But then we have the crazy idea to invite for the tents in João Pessoa in northeast Brazil, a small city. And this was a very uh, easy decision. We need to avoid Sao Paulo, Rio, Brasilia. Let's go to the northeast, a poor part of the country, not so well developed but a nice place, nice beaches, and I think that most of the people enjoy it. I'm very frustrated now that the German country has a very successful event, so now they take over the, the probably the, the first position because until 2010, I received so many support that we have a very good, but probably I need to give up to the Germans, so <laughs> congratulations for the Germans <laughs> present in the room. <laughs> but going back, uh, IGF, uh, there is a strong criticism that the decision-making process is not strong enough. Uh, probably with that, that can be improved. But uh, we support very much the young people. Uh, I need to recognize, Vint, that you help us in João Pessoa to bring around 80 people from Latin America to João Pessoa, and now this is a new movement inside IGF to I don't know how many we have here in Germany, but uh, I received a number of around 150 or, or more. My understanding is young people need to listen to us, uh, let's say, trying to organize and to support and train these people. We need to listen to uh, young people coming or new people coming from other countries, uh, Latin America, Africa, Asia. Sometimes they are waking up exactly now so the best platform for me is a multi-stakeholder model that we can discuss uh, sometimes without the need to take a decision. For sure, we, we like to see uh, improvements, but sometimes we need time. So I uh, like to support and uh, request uh, uh, 
I would like to see other people stepping in to supporting IGF, not only bringing people or participating. Probably if we put together the money that Brazil is not a rich country, uh, we use the money from our domain names. We don't receive money from the government. was not paid by our government, was paid by CGI, the steering committee of the internet in Brazil. We organized two events and we are already alive. We, we don't spend our, our money. So it was able to support uh, not only the Secretariat, but organize two events. So again, let me uh, say the IGF is the best platform that on the moment I see that bring us together. And I am happy uh, that I am part of this process and willing to follow this process uh, so long as I can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hartmut. And it certainly would be good to go to a new country, but if you feel up to the challenge, 2023, 24, and 25, I believe, are still, <laughs> are still open for hosts. We need to start again on the rotation. Four times in Europe is not fair. Let's go to other countries. And probably, the, if we have a high standard, some countries don't have the, 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 to invite. So we need to probably see a new model that we can go to other countries too. No, I mean, I, I just I think that's a very good point because there are certainly expectations coming from this meeting with respect to things like the high-level leaders meeting, which we used to have at the beginning of IGFs, and then the last two years, because of the timing, week before Christmas, one year, and um, Paris Peace Forum, um, and the timing of that one, we didn't. That would have meant the high-level leaders meeting was on a Sunday and competing with other events. So. But if there's an expectation that that is supported, and I think there are expectations that we continue some significant engagement with parliamentarians and maybe even SMEs, of course, that does start to raise the, the financial bar for the meeting. So I, I think we do need to think, think of some different um, um, models. Um, yes, Benny, you had the floor. I'm sorry, you were opening the floor, right? The next item is for Armin Plume from UNDESA to um, provide some additional background on the IGF project document budgets, things, and then open the floor. So, so just, to thank, just, just to thank, actually, that's what I wanted to say. I wanted to thank UNDESA and the uh, IGF Secretariat because those of us, I'm on the MAG, uh, Benny Malkowski from ICANN, but I have seen what these people are doing uh, back in New York and in Geneva, and given the little amount of funding that, I mean, they're underfunded all the time, but given what they do for the money and the time that they spent, I think they deserve a big round of applause uh, for their work. And yes, thank you. And also, and also uh, maybe somebody already mentioned it, but you, Lynn, have served uh, as a MAC chair in really difficult times when we didn't have time to organize properly meetings, and then this time uh, around, which the German government and the German parliament deserve special thanks for their contributions, both financially, but also, I mean, look at the venue, look at the organization and everything. So uh, you're, you've raised the bar uh, much higher than before. And I think um, we, we, with Henriette, and I'm unfortunately serving for another year, uh, not because of uh, this, but I only have one more year left, but I think it's going to be really challenging to try to get to the same level. And um, I'm very hopeful by what Vince said and everyone else is saying about, you know, not only financial contribution, but also engagement uh, with other uh, ways and means. So thanks again to everyone who, who made this possible. No, thank you, Venny, uh, Venny. But I think um, at one level, your thanks for misplaced. I mean, of course, this venue and everything we have is because of the German contribution and the time the German um, government actually had to host it, which is significant. And then, of course, the effort of the MAG. I mean, I said in one session yesterday that I think we've had a two-hour MAG meeting every other week since December, and we just finished three weeks ago, and we've had three physical three-day meetings. Um, that was because of the additional things we're trying to pick up. It was because we were trying to improve a lot of the processes in the background. But, but honestly, that may not always be sustainable. We had a great mag um, coming in the last couple of years. Sometimes it takes the newcomers a little bit of time to, to step in, but in this case it didn't. And people put in tremendous individual efforts and tremendous time commitments. 
And we won't always necessarily have that with every mag. I mean, this is not people's full-time job. So I think, again, we need to really find a way to build up the resources in the, in the Secretariat to support that. And I think more properly move some of that work back to the Secretariat and let the advisory group really start to look more at outreach efforts and more strategic efforts. But again, that is um, something for the incoming chair and the incoming MAG. And the one thing I am thankful for is that um, Dessa did work with the Secretary General's office to get the timely appointment of the MAG and the MAG chair. Um, the last two years, it's been this week during the IGF, which is tremendous, because in, in past years, we literally had a three-month lag between the old MAG and MAG chair being stood down and the new one coming in. And it was a terrible loss of time, terrible loss of momentum, and was one of the biggest things impacting our ability to make the improvements we actually wanted. Um, and I know I beat that drum awfully hard <laughs> in New York for a long time. So I really want to recognize the fact that, in fact, we have turned that around the last couple of years and certainly hope that continues. But let me move now to the, to the next part of the agenda where I think Armin, Armin Plum, you're going to um, talk us through some of the high-level points here. Yeah, thank you, Lynn. Um, I want to start by saying it's a bit unusual for finance people to get applause especially when you report on a loss, but it's, it's good. Um, the, the IGF is an unusual project, so I'm not too surprised. Um, so the, the IGF grant, and I wanted to repeat what uh, Lynn has been saying, the IGF grant um, is not used for funding this event. The, the host country and host countries are supposed to fund this event, so not a dollar of the contribution that is coming to DESA for what is called the IGF Trust Fund uh, is used for this, uh, for this event. I want to make that clear because that's one of the common misunderstandings. Um, the other common misunderstanding, and, and Lynn has also mentioned it, the IGF is purely extra budgetary funded. Um, the Secretary General, even if he wanted, cannot dedicate regular budget or assessed contributions to the IGF. Basically, the mandate that has been given to, to him by the General Assembly it's very clear that it's a, it's a extra budgetary and it's purely extra budgetary activity, um, which makes this all very exciting for us. I mean, in, in DESA, we, um, we have a number of, of projects, obviously. Um, the IGF um, grant is one of two multi-donor um, projects, uh, which is complex but interesting. Um, the other one, just so that you have heard about it, is the, uh, the Khmer Rouge tribunals in Cambodia, which is a completely different animal, and I'll leave it there. Um, what makes the IGF also unique is that it is multi-stakeholder in substance, and it's also multi-stakeholder in donors. And Lynn has already mentioned that we have, uh, we would like to have um, equal representation between the multi-stakeholder groups when it comes to receiving funds. This is unfortunately not the case. Um, Lynn has mentioned we have about 50% uh, 40, 50 percent government, 40, 50 percent um, what we call the technical community, and we're left with about 10 percent that come from the private sector. Uh, we are currently, we have about 15, I would say, active donors right now. There were about 30 over time. Um, if you look at the project document of the IGF, we are supposed to use these funds obviously for the actual secretariat, uh, for the, the three people that are currently sitting in Geneva. Um, but we are also supposed to use it for funding the MAC meetings throughout the year. We are supposed to fund inter certain intersessional activities, and we're supposed to fund capacity building activities. And um, this, the part in DESA that manages financially the, the IGF um, is actually the capacity building office. Um, so we would we would be thrilled to use these funds really for capacity building, but we can't because we don't have really the funding for it. Um, let me give you some figures. So we have, um, this year we have received about $900,000, which is, um, as Lynn was saying, uh, approximately a third or 40% of what the budget is. Um, of this, we are spending about 600000 just for running the secretariat, which are the three people, and we all agree that three staff members are not sufficient to actually run this IGF, so these uh, three people in Geneva are doing a, an incredible job. Um, then we spend about $200,000 for 
the MAC meetings for traveling the developed country participants, developing country participants, sorry, uh, to the MAC meetings, typically in Geneva, which leaves us with about eighty, ninety thousand dollars that we are spending, that we have this year spent on uh, capacity building, basically funding the, the NRIs. Um, and we would love to see um, more of that. We would really want to do more in that, in that area. Um, one other uh, point is that even amongst the, the, I would say, traditional donors and the, the reliable donors, um, we are getting the contributions on an annual basis. There are, up to now, there are three donors, and these are the EU, the Netherlands, and Germany, that are giving us multi-year uh, contributions, which is very important for us for, for planning, for contingency planning, and for continuity planning. So we have a very thin basis on which we can, we can extend contracts of the stuff, for example, and we would like to do that uh, much, much more in advance. So um, if there are new donors and if you're considering um, providing funds for the IGF, it would be excellent if that could be done in a kind of recurrent uh, fashion. And I know that a lot of the donors that are giving funds on an annual basis actually do, uh, do, it, and do it recurrently. It's just that they can't, for internal reasons, commit more than 12 months in advance, and, and that's perfectly fine. Um, yeah, I don't know if there is any, anything else that, that I should add at this moment. We are, we are here. I mean, I'm here, Sonia, who is the new finance officer of the IGF. Uh, we are here today. We're here for the rest of the week. If anybody has any specific questions on how this works, I mean, I can briefly tell you, I mean, it would be an agreement between the donor and DESA. It would be an exchange of letters, typically, um, where you would commit to funds and to provide the funds into this, uh, into this IGF grant, or the trust fund, as it's known. And then we would report back through an official financial statement, obviously. I mean, all of this goes through the UN um, official oversight mechanisms and accounting mechanisms. But we also report, um, basically, I think on every MAC meeting, we have always had a donors meeting where we report back throughout the year on what is the financial situation of the IGF. And we'll continue to do that. Yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Armin. Monsieur, is there anything you'd like to, to add? Or, and then we'll open the floor for questions. Uh, thank you, Armin. Thank you, Ms. Lynn. Um, there's absolutely nothing. I think uh, Armin really captured uh, everything really well. But we will have a more uh, info uh, informative uh, donor session this evening, so everyone's invited to join there as well. Thank you. I mean, I'd also like to recognize the efforts you've done to actually simplify the donor process as well um, over the years. That is a process. It's not particularly well known to a lot of the entities in here. I know that's been, been very helpful. Maybe I might just make it a little more real too. And you know, if the if the IGF trust fund doesn't have funds, there are no contracts for staff in the secretariat. There is no little safety valve. There is nothing behind that keeps the secretariat there open and running. They need the funds, and in fact, they need the funds in hand to actually be able to extend those forward-looking contracts. What would be really helpful is if people um, that are in this room, they obviously care a lot about the IGF um, and our donors, would actually take those messages back to people that you also think should be participating and should be um, contributing to the IGF. There's nothing better than somebody who's actually putting their own kind of skin in the game, if you will, to actually say, this is why I do what I do, and this is why it's important, and this is why you should consider doing the same thing. Happy to talk to you or anybody in your management team to make that happen, and or I can introduce you to people in the secretariat, people on the MAG, people in DESA, that will help make those arguments as well. You don't need to you know, close it yourself. You just need to open the door and make the introduction and then bring in other people to help, to help make that sale. I think we still have a, a few more minutes in, in um, the room here, so are there any questions? Uh, th this is Vince Cerf. It, it's a naive question. Um, there is this organization called the UN Foundation. It, it's, it's separate from the United Nations, and if I remember correctly, it was set up when Ted Turner offered 
a significant donation on an annual basis for a period of 10 years. Uh, my question is whether there is any conceivable reason to turn in their direction at all, uh, either for help, uh, assistance, uh, maybe even fundraising. And, and I, like I say, I'm very uh, naive in, uh, about this, so um, I'll be happy to learn that that might not be the best idea in the world. Uh, yeah, thanks. That's a, that's a good question. Uh, we have not yet contacted the UN Foundation. I know that they are one of the entities, the Global Compact is one of the entities that facilitates uh, private sector um, donations to the UN. Uh, we have not reached out to them yet for the sole reason that um, I think they would actually charge a, an additional overhead on top of the contributions, and I'm not sure we want to go that way. But it's true that we've had uh, uh, especially the U.S.-based uh, private sector entities do have problems donating to the United Nations for tax reasons. And, and we had, uh, but we had, uh, have been quite flexible, I mean, with uh, Google, for example, by other Tides Foundation. We have possibilities to actually come up with agreements that cater for those, uh, for those requirements. But we will, I think, Sonia, looking, looking at you, we will, we will go back and check with the colleagues in the, in the Global Compact and the UN Foundation whether there is a possibility. Thank you, Vint. That was a good question. Anyone else? Yes, Duncan. Uh, thanks, Lynn. Um, uh, and again, uh, maybe a naive question. I did go back and read the notes from this meeting last year in Paris, so it was some good background there. But I notice in the discussion we talk about governments, we talk about the private sector. And I'm just wondering in this discussion, this group, how much thought's been given to philanthropy and foundations? because Within the philanthropic community are people, I think, who would very much share and be interested in the, the goals of the IGF, and even more so than the private sector or the governments may have the ability to engage and support. So I'm just wondering if that was discussed. I mean, it, I'll have to look to Armin and, and, and I guess from sort of a historical perspective or, or maybe Changatai. Um, it was one of the things we'd actually, uh, one of the sort of set of entities or activities we thought about reaching out to when we were doing all the really active fundraising work last year. Um, we didn't get there. <laughs> and then this past year has been subsumed with a host of other things as well. But it's certainly a, you know, an appropriate kind of vector, if you will, for additional support. But I don't know if something's happened before. Um, no, nothing has happened before. Um, I want to add, though, that uh, DESA is organizing, as you may or may not know, the high-level political forum every year in New York in July. And th this year, this uh, July, um, we, our division, organized actually a, a, speci a special event just for the philanthropic uh, entities to see how they can contribute to the SDGs and to implementing the overall 2030 agenda. And I think from there, maybe we can actually pull some contacts and, and raise awareness and point to this leaflet, and maybe there is actually a possibility. That's a good idea. Anybody else who's looking for the floor? Well, without putting Henriette on the spot, Henriette, is there anything you'd like to say in closing here? <laughs> No, I think just just um, to to echo what Lina said in in thanking people and um, and really to appreciate those that have come and shared their their, their contribution. I think as Chad said and and Christine, this it's very hard to actually get a to even quantify the scale of the contributions to the IGF, if you look at the, at, at the sum of it. And, and maybe that is something that we can also try and find a way of doing. But it's just very encouraging to see that there is support and to rely on the MAG members. Veni, yes, you have one year. I hope you work hard. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, and, and, and the sense that I think we, we realize this is challenging, but I also get the sense that there's commitment quite distributed commitment to find creative ways of meeting those challenges. And Lynn, just thank you so much for, for what you've done. And as has been pointed out, 
you had some very difficult times during this term. And that's testimony, I think, to the IJF's endurance that it, that it does survive those. And I think it will go from strength to strength. It's either endurance or it's stubbornness on the part of every participant in the IGF community, and I'm, I'm leaning towards the latter. <laughs> um, well, I mean, just would echo Henriette's comments and, and thank everybody um, for everything you've done, for obviously for being here, but for all the support. Um, you know, it's, it's really this group of people that I think really give the MAG a lot of, um, there's a word I'm looking for, but it's literally just confidence, I think, that we need to keep going forward and we need to keep um, pushing um, because we are able to keep it, keep it growing. And in fact, with every year, I think, as Nita Desai said, you know, this will always be the best IGF. And we've always tried to find something, um, something new to make it, um, you know, even more, more useful. So, I mean, again, just thank you very, very much. And if there is anything we can do to help with your outreach or your contacts, um, let us know. Changatai is obviously very visible and very recognizable. Um, you know, many of us are here. We're here to help. You know, we will talk to whomever you suggest we might talk to. Um, and, and please, please don't hesitate to, to make those connections and, and make that ask. First rule of fundraising is you have to ask. <laughs> um, thank you, everybody. Really appreciate your being here so early. Have a good day.